following program is classified G. It's suitable for all ages. A very good evening and thank you for joining us on another episode on Business Best and this is a platform where we showcase the best in the business and we will be introducing to you people who have excelled in their particular field in order to showcase their latest developments in their respective industry. Now Uber this week has launched its Sri Lanka Economic Impact Report highlighting the kind of contribution the company has managed to make in the country through its businesses Uber and Uber Eats. Compiled by Public First, a UK-based policy research firm and the report highlights how Uber has helped transform the on-demand economy for consumers, drivers and delivery partners. The report was launched in the national capital by Honourable Prime Minister Mr Dinesh Gunavardhana and to talk more about about what the genesis of this report is all about and how it should be seen in the current economic contracts. We have uh, Mike Oyel, who is the Senior Director, Public Policy and Government Relations, Asia Pacific Region at Uber. Mike, thank you so much and it's my pleasure to have you on the show with me today. Pleasure's all mine, thank you. Now to start off with the discussion, Mike, now Uber is releasing its you know, economic impact regarding on the Sri Lankan context. Why do you think that this uh, activity was necessary at this point? And what were the key features or the highlights that actually popped out to you? Well, it's really important always to understand what kind of impact you're having in an economy and society. And so something we undertook across the entire region was a comprehensive study to look at the economic impact, uh, as well as some of the different things that we hear from consumers, uh, restaurant partners, drivers, uh, as, as they work with Uber. And so we decided we wanted to do a specific study on Sri Lanka, which is an exciting and fast growing market. Um, there's a couple things that really stood out, which were really, really exciting from my point of view. The first was if you look at the overall economic impact in 2021 uber across all of its lines of business contributed about 81 billion lankan rupees uh, to the to the economy which we think is quite substantial and as you look at what that really means we start to see that it's driving benefits for consumers um, as well as for the restaurant partners and for the the drivers from a consumer point of view, we're talking about a consumer surplus of around 52 billion Lanka rupees. And so this is the kind of money that uh, consumers actually feel like they're saving as a result of having these services. And then when you start to look at people like the drivers and the delivery partners, you're seeing that there's actually incremental uh, income that they're earning. So if you take, for example, uh, the drivers that are out there, whether they're on tooks or motos or cars, what they're saying is that in the course of a year, they're actually getting an extra about 750 million Lankan rupees that are going into their pockets that they would not have ordinarily earned. And so you can see how technology is actually creating additional economic opportunities for them. Yeah, that's right, Mike. Now, even I had a look at the report and the numbers were astonishing, you know, that y'all have contributed so much to the Sri Lankan economy as well. Now, keeping aside the numbers, what mm. are the other themes that, you know, Uber has come up with and that has been, you know, highlighting to you? Well, there's a, there's a couple really interesting ones. I, I think one of the ones that really stood out to us was around the, the importance of safety for, for consumers. And so we saw about 96% of women uh, who use Uber say that safety is one of the key considerations when they use the Uber app. So that was certainly one. Uh, we see other things like uh, restaurants are finding that, that technology uh, is really enabling their business and unlocking new opportunities for them. So you know, one, of the, one of the fun stats in there was that we saw restaurants say that they actually got about 2.1 billion uh, additional Lankan rupees that they would not have ordinarily got. And you think about a time when restaurants, drivers, ordinary people are struggling, right? They, they, they've certainly been through some tough times between financial crisis and COVID. And to be able to still get that additional and incremental uh, money into their pockets is, was suit, certainly very, very important. That's definitely true. I believe that safety is one of the number one priorities we have and something that would determine people whether to use a taxi or not. And now coming back to the questions, now there are some areas where Uber has met their expectations as well. And so where do you feel that you know Uber can grow more and where are the other opportunistic areas where Uber can you know properly shine? 
Yeah, well, as you say, we're, we're, we're thrilled over our seven-year history here to have seen a lot of growth and to, to have to see high degrees of satisfaction from consumers and partners that we work with. Um, but the job is never done, right? We, we, we've only been here seven years, and we, we, we intend to be here a lot longer. So some of the things that, that we're thinking about is how can we be even better partners uh, to the restaurant industry? Uh, how do we expand the selection? How do we enable more of those businesses with technology? Um, a second thing that we think is, is super important is as we look to the future, we see the importance of electric vehicles, we see the importance of, of moving to a, a, a less carbon intensive world. And so what are the things that we can do to really enable uh, and, and push the industry forward there? And so that'll be through partnerships, that'll be working with our delivery partners on things like transitioning from bicycles and stop using as much petrol. And those those types of things are going to be really important for us as we look forward. That's right. Now I think EV vehicles are gaining popularity day by day and especially you know with the fuel crisis, not just in Sri Lanka but around the world, you know, uh, with the prices going up with crude oil and henceforth. Um, Mike, a little bit about your experience with Uber. Now, you've been engaged with Uber for quite a long time. And uh, Uber is not just working here in uh, Sri Lanka. It's operating in other countries as well. So compared to other nations, how do you think Uber is faring here in Sri Lanka? Well, I, I like to think of Sri Lanka as small but mighty. Um, there's there's a lot of really interesting things that are happening. We again, we see great work with our our, our partners, and we see you know a consumer base that really enjoys using the product. Um, what I really like to see more of is bringing. Uh, some of the different things that we're doing from elsewhere in the world into into Sri Lanka. So, you know, for example, EVs is a is a is a really obvious one for us. Um, I, I think that uh, seeing if there's other ways that we can we can um, bring more of our technology to bear uh, in terms of safety features and those types of things. Um, so, I, there's there's obviously more to do, uh, but but I've got lots of confidence in Sri Lanka going forward. This report that y'all have uh, published now uh, with the Sri Lankan context itself, how do you feel now? How is Sri Lanka um, doing in terms compared to the international nations? Uh, it's doing well, right? It, it, it continues to grow, and I think you know it's easy to think about our business in the context of the speed bumps that have that have come its way. So if you think about uh, COVID as as something that was damaging for our business as every business. Um, but one of the cool things that we were able to see was the re-emergence of, of that business. So we see it continue to grow back uh, even despite the crisis. Same thing with the fuel crisis. Uh, certainly, you know that 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 makes things harder for for drivers, for delivery partners, for restaurants uh, to be able to to run their their own businesses. Uh, but we see demand continuing to to come back as there is strong need for the services that that we're able to provide. How do you think Uber coped up, you know, with the economic crisis and the shortage of fuel at the moment and uh, the scarcity of drivers as well? Because people were not able to find their own vehicles or even fuel per se to run the vehicles. So what were the alternatives that you all used in order to combat this uh, situation? Well, I mean, one of the really interesting ones that, that we used to combat was uh, working with people to transition them to regular bicycles. It's, a, it's an old school technology empowered by a new school technology. And when you're able to, to create those connections, uh, people were able to earn income. And at the end of the day, during a financial crisis, the most important thing is really ensuring that people have the food they need to eat and the money in their pockets to be able to survive. And so if we're able to create economic livelihood opportunities with bicycles, great. And I think the other thing that we did through the crisis was looking at some of our own resources, you know, partnering with the Red Cross, partnering with Robin Hood Army to see are there ways that we can enable people who are vulnerable, whether they're um, people that are not able to get fuel for their cars right now, can we make sure that they, they at least have um, food in, in, you know, for their families. How do you engage with your drivers? Because drivers play an important role for Uber, may it be Uber or Uber Eats. It's them who run the business and you need them to deliver or transport people or anything of that sort. So how do you have that resilience with your drivers and how do you keep them you know, happy in your work environment? Yeah, I mean, as you say, they're, they're, they're absolutely core to the business that we run. And so we're always trying to get feedback from them. We run listening sessions. We try to engage with them. We spend time with them uh, and, and get to know them. Obviously, we see a lot of stuff trend-wise in the data. So you can see you know, how, how, how are they doing. But there's something really important about getting that real-time feedback from them about what are their, um, their needs, their concerns, their issues, the things that they're happy with. Um, so for example, I came into, into Sri Lanka last night and I got 
got to sit down with a driver who'd only been on the platform for three weeks. I explained I was from Uber. He thought he was in trouble. Um, <laughs> and, and we started to talk about the things that he liked about it. He liked how easy it was to get on the platform. He liked how it was really simple. He could turn it on and off when he wanted to. At the same time, he said, hey, fuel prices are, are high. Like, could you help us think uh, more about how you can, you can help us out here? And so those types of, of real life interactions with the drivers and delivery partners, they're real people um, that are working really hard every single day that we, we try to make sure that we, we get that feedback and we're as responsive as we can possibly be to it. Another concern which I want to touch on is, you know, the safety of women and children, you know, that's something that really determines whether you want to use a taxi or travel by yourself or something of that sort. So when encountering with your Uber drivers, they need to be, sh uh, Uber needs to make sure that, you know, these are disciplined people because the exploitations here in Sri Lanka are immensely high, you know, especially for women. And, but when I looked at your report, over 60% of the women say that, you know, Uber is safe and I prefer using Uber because of the safety and they feel safe while traveling. So how have you managed to make this happen and how do you uh, plan on making this safer for everyone to travel? Yeah, uh, safety is, is, is incredibly important to our business. It doesn't work if people don't trust it. Um, and so it's, you know, we, we do a number of different things, starting with before the trip, we're doing things like background treks, we're doing things like road safety training, we're doing things like, you know, helping them understand our standards that exist out there. Um, then when you're on the trip, we have things like our safety center, so you can get in touch with somebody if something's going wrong. We allow you to share your trip with somebody so that they can track you. Um, say, you know, if I'm coming home from, from a dinner and I'm, I'm a single female, I'm able to say, hey, here's, here's my trip details. You can track it. And also, remember, we, we're also tracking the cars. And so we can see if something is, is perhaps going wrong or the journey is taking a detour and we can, we can give a call to see if everything is, is all right. And then finally, you know, things do sometimes go wrong. And that's why we have best in class insurance and we have uh, teams of people that will respond and help people uh, if, if ever there's a, a crash or an incident or something like that to, to make sure that everybody is taken care of. Um, but the thing is that, as we say, safety never stops. Uh, there's always a lot more to do. So working on through partnerships with law enforcement, doing more training for our drivers, uh, seeing if there's other technology that we can we can bring to bear that helps us to get a better sense of how how things are going. The star ratings that we have to look and see, you know, is there any feedback about the driver? Just to make sure that there's those extra la layers of comfort that are there for anybody who's traveling. As you said, safety has no end and we should be adapting to it and making sure that the people traveling in are safe, even the drivers per se. All right, to continue this discussion, we'll have to go into a short commercial break. We'll be back soon. You're watching Business Best. Welcome back to Business Best and we are in discussion with Mike Orgill who is the Senior Director, Public Policy and Government Relations, Asia Pacific Region at Uber. So Mike, I think in the first segment you explained about what your report was all about and the numbers that Uber has received in terms of you know, contributing towards the Sri Lankan economy. And what I want to ask you next, next is, how is uh, Uber connected with uh, public transport? It's a really great question. Uh, what we see is that the future of transportation is not just people going from point A to point B, but really using all different methods of transportation. And so one thing that we see in our research around the world is that a significant number of trips either start or end at a public transport stop. And so you can think of Uber in terms of mobility as a last mile solution. So you can take a bus a long distance and then you need a, a took to get you home. That's the, a really good use case for Uber. And we see that as a, as a really normal thing uh, to, to, to happen here in Sri Lanka as well. Is this plan implemented in any way or is it uh, something that you all want to implement in the future? Well, this is something that happens organically. This is people have figured out that they need, you know, public transportation might be really, really good along a certain main road and they, they have lots of options there. But to, to go that last, you know, kilometer or something like mm -hmm. that, that's where Uber becomes very, very useful. Now, certainly we do have tie-ups with, with public transport uh, departments and agencies around the world. I don't think we have anything in Sri Lanka to announce just yet, uh, but certainly there's always opportunities for us to think of Uber as complementary to a public transport system and not a replacement for it. 
Okay, now when talking about Uber Eats, how has your company enhanced the opportunities and how was it advantageous for the restaurants here in Sri Lanka? Yeah, well the, the restaurants are you know, the, one of the biggest things that for them that they're always caring about is how many people can I get to order food for me? And so what we see is that Uber can be a really important marketing channel for them to reach new customers. Now obviously a restaurant will have its own brand, its own identity, and the restaurants are going to have their own customers who are loyal and come to them all the time. With Uber Eats, they're actually in front of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people who are looking for different things and different options, and they can explore new restaurants from the comfort of their homes. And what we see from the report was that actually the restaurants are getting incremental demand. I think initially when, when we started looking at Uber Eats, some of the restaurants had some skepticism that, hey, I think this is gonna cannibalize my existing, uh, my existing diners. They're not gonna come to my restaurant, they're just gonna sit there and uh, it's gonna replace those people. And what we're seeing is that actually, no, we're putting an incremental 2.2 billion Lankan rupees into those restaurants um, through the technology. So they're reaching more customers, they're getting more demand, and they're able to earn more money. Well, I able to prove the fact that no, we're actually giving in uh, much of the revenue and giving you more customers because they actually did have a good valid point. People will stop uh, visiting restaurants physically because they would rather prefer the convenience. I, I think that what's, what's become really interesting is that that's not really proven to be the case, is that people are, are eating more from restaurants than in the past. Um, some of us might, might not always like that as much, but um, and we wish we were better home cooks, but now it's, you know, Going to a restaurant isn't the whole excursion of I need to go somewhere and, and get dressed up. I can also have that same good food in the comfort of my own home. All right. How have you seen the engagement of uh, Sri Lanka restaurants engaging with Uber in the past uh, year or so? Uh, it's been really exciting just to see the growth of the number of restaurants that, that have come onto the platform. And so what we see is that uh, you know, we have some of the, the, the best uh, the best restaurants are out there. We've got you know enormous selection across the the five markets in Sri Lanka that we operate in, and uh, we see that they're generally very happy with with the Uber Eats service. Uh, again, being able to attract uh, more customers uh, for them, and then they they tell their other restauranter uh, friends that this is an opportunity to drive incremental demand. Um, and particularly during a time like COVID, when it was you know, people were more reluctant to go out or unable to go out, uh, this created new opportunities for them. It actually was a bit of a lifeline uh, for many of these restaurants. And so I think we've got a really strong partnership with the restaurant industry and certainly something that we want to continue building as we go forward. I think the COVID pandemic actually boomed businesses with Uber Eats, I would say if I'm not mistaken. Oh, absolutely. I, like, as, as you can imagine, when people were, were locked down or nervous about going out or caring about their, you know, their, their health and safety, you had a twofold problem. One, you had people that were trying to raise children and work and provide for themselves uh, in an environment that was incredibly stressful. And you had restaurants that couldn't have people in their restaurants. And so Uber Eats was able to be there as a bit of a connector between two different groups of people that had problems and created a solution for the restaurants and for the consumers. Exactly. One thing I really liked about it is it was not just the restaurants, but also grocery stores as well that y'all did deliveries to, which made it extremely easy for the consumers to use as well. So now coming back to um, EV vehicles, because as you said, the popularity for these vehicles are growing. So what are the future plans that Uber has to you know, uh, change from the current system and shift into EV vehicles? Well, our approach to EVs has largely been a partnership-led approach. We're not about to start manufacturing EVs of our own. Yeah. And instead, what we're trying to do is we're trying to work with the best and brightest who are producing EVs uh, in the most sustainable way uh, and bring down the total cost of ownership for a car. Because right now, uh, if you look at any kind of EV, car, two, uh, two-wheeler, uh, those, those vehicles are just a little bit more expensive. And as the, the, the costs come down, the, it becomes much better or much easier for somebody to switch. And so what we're trying to do is work with our drivers to get, get that total cost of ownership down and incentivize them to switch. And so we do partnerships uh, with uh, Tesla in, in the United States, or we in Australia are waiving a certain number of a certain amount of our service fees to incentivize people to, to switch to full EVs. And so these types of things really try to move the industry forward in quite a number of ways. And as we look at a place like Sri Lanka, there's always opportunities here. We know the environment 
environment is, is precious here in Sri Lanka, and we want to also play that role in, in enabling uh, Sri Lanka to, to make its transition uh, to EVs as well. Now, since Mike, you've been uh, working in Uber for quite a long time now, how can you describe the journey you've had with Uber, like comparing to the previous years and to now, how has Uber transitioned? Well, you, you could you could think of, of, of Uber in a, in a number of different phases, but certainly there was the the initial high growth phase uh, that that took us through, uh, say about 2017, when when uh, the mobility industry was really being disrupted, and, and bringing this idea of technology to mobility was was incredibly new, and it was very exciting, but uh, disruptive at the same time. And I think if you look from uh, 2017 to to 2020. 20, you kind of look at that as a, a, a the growing up and maturing phase of the business, and then you have the the pandemic, uh, and until now, which has been it's time to get really resilient. It's time to get very adaptive, and really think through how can this business be an all weather business? How can this always be able to be relevant to people? And so, if it's COVID and there's lockdowns, we have an Uber Eats business that's able to help people. If uh, times are good and people are traveling, that we need to be. Uh, launching better and improved mobility products for people to get around. So Mike, what are your next plans with Uber to implement in the recent future? Well, there's, there's a lot to look forward to. I think number one is really working to, to expand the service areas that we cover and making sure that we have the right sets of products across each place. And so ensuring that we have the right mix of cars, tokes, motorcycles, et cetera, and that we're able to be that mobility provider across every type of, of category that's, that's there. On the delivery side, certainly it's trying to expand selection, working with our restaurant partners to provide great quality, and then expanding into, into grocery as well. And then I think if you look at some of our uh, more, uh, some of the, the pilots that we're doing elsewhere in the world, we're trialing things with freight, we're trialing things with autonomous vehicles, with autonomous delivery. All these things are, are things that are certainly out there on the, on the horizon that, that we're excited about the future of. All right, I think we are reaching the end of our program as well. So as my last question, now Uber is working over 70 countries, so what's the impact Sri Lanka has in Uber and what has the impact Uber has made for Sri Lanka and why do you think that you know Sri Lanka is a place to grow and it has many opportunities? Well, I think Sri Lanka is one of the most special countries on earth. You have an incredibly resilient group of people uh, who are technolog te technologically sophisticated, um, that are adventurous and are willing to try new things. And I think when we look at, at Sri Lanka as a business, it performs well, it grows quickly, and it rebounds. Uh, whenever there's a, a, a crisis or a challenge, uh, somehow Sri Lanka keeps coming back. And it's, it's incredibly exciting for us to be part of that journey. Uh, we know that at the end of the day, this, this whole business is, as you say, powered by great drivers, great delivery people, great restaurant partners, great merchants. And our job is really to try to enable that whole ecosystem uh, with the technology that we build and, and uh, help you know, be part of that, that growth journey that Sri Lanka is on. All right. So do you think Uber has a long-term view of how this market will shape up in the near future? Yeah, we have to take a long-term view. We've, we've been in Sri Lanka for about seven years. Uber Eats has only been here for about five years. And so as we look at uh, the future, uh, we think the future is bright and we want to keep being able to, to do what we do well and keep expanding it to more and more people. All right, Mike, as well. This is all the time we have on the show as well. And I wish you all the very best with all the expansions and the innovations that you are planning to do in the future as well. It was nice talking to you as well. Thanks so much. All right. And that was our program on Business Best. We will be back again next week with another program or a service or product that would interest you. And just in case you can watch us on air, you can always rewatch by catching us on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash English. I'm Suzanne Shanali. Stay safe and have a good night.